First of all, I would like to thank um, David for having me here. It's really wonderful and I'm learning so much and I really have the feeling that, I actually, I really hope that this is just as the first step of a series of conferences or things that we can do together. So I really hope that, as I said, this is like the first kick, yeah. Um, so I'm going to start with a bit of my background. Um, I'll tell you a bit what, what I'm doing. And then um, I'm going to try to convince you that um, we need a, some sort of like um, shift in the conceptual toolbox that we're using to understand certain phenomena and um, why I think the brain shouldn't be necessarily connected with the mental processes in general. Uh, and I'm going to end very quickly with something that is cooking on the oven in, uh, in my lab. But first, as I said, a bit of like my background. So I'm a trained philosopher. I'm a trained armchair philosopher, right? And during my PhD, I was obsessed with the mind-body problem. So how exactly is like something which is happening in the brain gives rise to the experience of like being me and um, having certain experience. So the famous example was like the philosopher debated for ages about you know, the reddishness of like seeing a tomato, red tomato is like what is happening, the, what is the qualia, the red qualia in the brain. And I did my PhD in Burgundy, in Dijon, and I was like, who cares about seeing a red tomato? It's how about drinking the wine? So it's like kind of like the, what it is like to actually drink the wine because I think that's way more important. So, well, the joke set apart that actually I was really interested in, you know, how exactly some sort of like physical or neural processes in the brain are connected with um, subjective experiences, yeah. And um, I know that there are a lot of like PhD students here and um, towards the end of my PhD, I was so fed up with the mind-body problem and I said, I, I, like, why did I do this to myself? P people ask me, why are you working on at the conference? What's your background? And I decided it's like, well, you know, when people ask you, it's like, have a pitch elevator, can you say in three couple of words what you actually after? And I said, I think I, I prefer to do that in a drawing. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you the drawing that I did when I was like a student back then. So it might be a trigger. So yeah. Okay, so here's the drawing I did. So you have a person and that's the puzzle philosopher. And there's this idea that somehow there is a divide between impure body, something that disappears in the world, right? And the pure mind, which is kind of like needs to stay there. And I actually asked myself, so what, where does this come from in the first place, right? Like this divide. So why do we even talk about mind and body in the first place? Um, and so I did some, being an armchair philosopher, I did a lot of like digging back into the literature um, in the history of philosophy. Um, and I bump into a lot of stuff, but one of the things that really attracted my attention was this idea of the Soma-Sema theory. Soma means body, Sema means tomb, right? So there was this idea that the, 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 the body is a tomb for the, for the soul, for the mind, and then we basically need to basically escape from <laughs> the impure body and somehow stick to whatever is like pure there in the, in the world, right? And then obviously the, the question with that, um, the obvious question is like, how exactly will you link these two together, right? And that's a question that for instance, like Aristotle was obsessed about, right? So he's trying to understand how exactly you can link these two um, realms together. And obviously when you go back, I'm, I'm actually, I'm rushing through the history of philosophy because I don't have time, but, um, it's like we came up right now with some sort of an inheritance, right, from this kind of like discussions, which is the fact that there is a mind, <laughs> whatever that means, nobody has actually good definition of what is the mind. Uh, everybody uses it, but I mean, we know what the body is, but nobody knows what the mind is. Um, it's some sort of inner realm uh, connected to the outside world via the senses to which only the eye has a privileged access and about which it has incorrigible knowledge. And the self forms like the self-evident starting point of an entire philosophical system. And the mind is somehow some different from the body. And the mind can grasp the nature of reality far more easily if it's not encumbered by um, corporeal, right? Something that um, disappears, yeah. So basically, 
I really like this. I saw it on Twitter. So like I should really, really use it on my slides. It's just like it's still somehow, you know, it's like it's very visual. So you have a homunculus in the head, in the brain. It's like you don't see the reality, but somehow your mind kind of like ah oh, see it. Yeah. Now, as I said, it's like this is my background. I was trained as an armchair philosopher during my PhD. I finally managed to get rid of the mind-body problem. I said, oh, thanks God, I finished with that. And I started to do a postdoc in, um, in um, a philosophy in Switzerland. And you know, you know, I think it involved also a couple of like red wines, glasses, and I was having like this existential question. It's like, do I really need to do, want to do this my entire career, right? It's like this type of uh, questions. And the obvious answer was like, no, <laughs> I don't want to do this. Uh, so um, David was, uh, was talking about thinking outside the box, right? So I was trying to do my research, still interested in these questions, but thinking outside the armchair, right? So I'm basically an armchair philosopher, trained armchair philosopher that jumped from the armchair into the empirical sea, so I took um, um, training in cognitive neuroscience. And right now, basically, I'm on a stage where I'm a philosopher working with scientists, basically developing an interdisciplinary lab, and um, I'm using all these uh, measures in my lab, some psychophysiological measure of what is happening in the body, um, behavioral, qualitative, phenomenological, neural, blah, 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 both in humans and artificial agents. So this is just the overview. But as I said, it's like I spent quite some time in um, working with a neuroscientist in uh, London around six years. And I was the philosopher in residence. And my job there was to ask annoying questions to the scientists, just like, uh, what do you mean by perception? Just like, what is social? And they were like, ah, it's like, who cares? And then one of the questions that I was asking is like, well, look around. There was no kids in the room. It's like just adults asking questions, and they look at each other, and they say, "It's like I should. I told you we shouldn't have a philosopher with us. It's obviously this kind of like, what do you mean we don't have kids in the room, right? It's like yeah, but I don't think that's trivial. And the point I want to make through with my talk, and actually this is something I want to start with, is that whenever we start investigating stuff like perception, cognition, actual whatever, we have implicitly built in an adult-centric bias. Right? So we start with things that appear to us right now. But if we really want to understand how things work, we need to basically understand how they develop and how they arise. Yeah? And why is this important? So just to give you one very small uh, example. So suppose you want to build a minimal model of this system. right? Um, and then you might be very tempted to just like take whatever that picture is there and just squeeze it, and make it small, and then you have a minimal mo model of that system. But if you take a developmental perspective, then you realize that actually the system, the properties that you have at different stages might be different for that, those that you have it like in a full-fledged adult manner, right? So if you really want to understand how the plant arises or the human arises, you really need to go back to the uh, square one. So this is where I'm standing right now. So I want to understand how we perceive ourselves and experience ourselves in the world from scratch, from the very beginning, right? Um, and uh, this is the reason I named my lab the co-embodied self lab, because I start with this idea that, you know, brains and bodies and minds, they don't emerge in a vacuum, but they emerge already in an environment. And in humans, because I'm interested in human uh, cognition, they basically don't emerge in a vacuum either, human bodies. So, um, and I'm saying this because I think it's important, sometimes can be controversial, but we are here to do disruptive science, so that's, that's fine. Um, so, it typically when people think of pregnancy, they typically associate it with a certain category of people that have the ability to carry babies in their bodies. But if you look at the phenomenon of developing body, all of you here have shared your body with the body of another person, so that's universal. So if you want to understand the developing of the human embodiment, necessarily we need to think to, to conceptualize this in relation to another body from the very beginning, right? So this is why um, I wanted to name my uh, lab the co-embodied self lab. So I, I necessarily, and all my experiments, I'm basically measuring what is happening in a human perception, human selfhood, human self-experience, embodied self-experience, never alone, <laughs> never individually, but in relation with um, um, others and environments, simply because from the score one, 
we are never alone. <laughs> we cannot even exist without the other from the very beginning. Okay, and here is a, a slide. So I'm super happy to be in the same room with um, uh, Pamela because uh, she's a rock star. So I have this like slides and all the possible talks I'm giving. Yeah, uh, I'm taking this like biogenic approach to cognition and. As she uh, nicely puts it, you know, there is the distinction between the anthropogenic approach, so you take the, the human as, you know, um, starting point, but I think we shouldn't obsess over that makes us special. I think in order to understand what makes us special, we need to understand what connects us with the other forms of living systems. So we need to s start with actually what connects us, not what differentiates us from the others, yeah. Um, and going back to this idea, so why are we so obsessed with this like idea of like pure mind and you have so many systems in philosophy about the, you know, critical thinking of the pure mind. And I think it's something related to the fact that, well, <laughs> we don't want to die. I mean, nobody wants to die. And it's just like, uh, we see the body disappearing and uh, we need to find a way to actually cope with this, um, you know, thing disappearing. So we need to find some sort of stable structure that stays there. And obviously logic and mathematics provides you this kind of like uh, pure form of structure that stays there uh, from the very beginning. So if we can find somehow <clears throat> the, you know, the invisible pure structure of experience, of cognition, blah, 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 then we kind of like nail it, you know, the, um, um, the eternity, so to speak, right? We get out of the time. Um, and this is because, as I said, it's like in, no matter how many wrinkles you have in your face, two plus two always equals four, right? But I disagree with that. I think, as I said, it's like I really want to go back to the body, to the impure body and bring back the animal, right? Um, and you start with this idea, as I said, it's like nobody wants to die. So it's like, um, it's just like self-preservation is so important. So the function of cognition and perception should be is somehow ultimately geared towards like maintaining this organism yeah, um, within a certain range for survival purposes, right? So I want to say, we say this as, a, as we don't perceive the world as it is in a pure manner. We perceive the world as we expect or want it to be prior, based on prior you know, um, experiences and also um, what we expect um, next. So if I want to put it in more like um, provocative manner, it's like, in real life, we really care more about the, our wrinkles that is you know, two plus two equals four, right? That's, that's something that we really need to um, bear in mind. Um, so what I'm going to put the, the, um, um, the reminder of my talk, I'm going to talk about this paper that um, we just published. It was a bit of a struggle to get it uh, <laughs> there, but we uh, managed to do it. So um, it's a theory paper where we basically propose a shift and defining the very term cognition, taking out from the brain, taking out from just like the neural processing, and going back to the self-organizing system, embodied self-organizing system in um, humans. Um, and we start with this like very basic idea that we are, I mean, it's not just us, uh, this, we are building upon existing work, right? So we're just like taking this idea a step forward. Um, it's like we are open systems, right? Even though we are individuals right now, it's just like we need to breathe all the time, right? So there is stuff coming from outside all the time in our bodies and needs to come inside and stop going out. <laughs> so it's kind of like all, this, all the time that we have, there are like changes between the organism and the environment and that happens even in absence of the conscious awareness that happens when you sleep as well, right? Um, and so that's, that's super important to bear in mind that we are vulnerable open systems and we need to basically interact with the environment, we depend upon them, yeah. Um, and I don't want to dispute the fact that the neurons are cool. I think neurons are super cool and yeah, we should focus on neurons because that's, that's, that's important. I would like to suggest that the focus on neurons may come from the fact that we are kind of like have this other centric bias, right? So it's like we, we take a system that is already fully fledged and how cognitive processing already neural is happening in adults and we look at, oh, this is so nice, so how exactly does this arise in the human brain? But if you take a development of perspective and try to understand how the organism evolves and how you get neurons and cognition from the first place, then you realize that you have way more cooler stuff happening before neurons start firing, yeah? Especially in relation to um, self-organizing system. 
Um, and as I said, it's like, this is kind of like a received view. I, and I know this is just like a drop in a sea and it's, I have to just like push a lot to actually get rid of this idea that somehow cognitive processing are just neural processing in the brain. But it's a step forward. So I, I yeah, my grandmother said it's like, if you don't do something about it, you don't have the right to complain about it. So I want to do something about it. So that's the, the, the first paper we published, it's about this, right? Um, and there is already work that for by Damasio and other colleagues that they by kind of like relate the uh, processing what is happening in the brain with very basic minimal homeostatic processing in the body. But this is not something we want to say. <laughs> uh, we want to say something even more radical, right? Um, so um, there is prevailing approach in, in the brain science that basically make a link between neural processing and cognitive processing. I mean, I spent six years of my career in the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience, yeah? So it's kind of like neuroscience of uh, cognition. Uh, but as I said, it's like, I think we should go back to scratch from the square one and to see that the fact that actually neurons are a type of cells, a very cool type of cells, but in order for neurons to function, they, we need some other type of like um, interactions to be there from the very beginning, and I think that's even more important. Um, so, as I said, as I, I'm being, uh, building up an existing work, and I look at um, going back to cells as the basic um, units of um, cognitive processing in uh, humans, um, and I want to say that the brain might not hold the monopoly of cognition, right? Um, uh, all cells are cognitive in the relevant functional uh, sense, and we want to say that basically cognition is a multi-scale web of dynamic processing distributing over, around, uh, across a vast array of co complex cellular um, and network systems operating over the entire body, not just um, the brain, yeah? At least in one, in the first um, uh, step. And um, as I said, it's like, there are a couple of systems there, but for me, it's really interesting uh, to focus on the immune system. Why? Because I was interested in self-organization and self-perception and self-awareness. Well, well before we actually have even neurons in, um, in our bodies from a developmental perspective, um, the organism, the developing self-organism, so what is a system that tells yourself which one is you, which one is not you? And you're just kind of like, if you're wrong and make the wrong decision, then you're kind of like, die. Uh, so you need, to, uh, you need to have that system in place um, and to work in tandem with other systems in the human body and the self biological self-organizing system of the human body well before we actually have um, uh, neurons. Yeah? Um, I'm sorry about the packed slide, but being a philosopher, I'm allowed to have some text on it. Yeah? Uh, you don't have to read that, but uh, uh, I, I can tell you in a couple of words. So. Um, so we, we want to zoom out, first of all, from the neurons, we want to zoom out from the brain, and we want to look at basically not, I, I don't think it's correct to say, to look at the bottom rock, like a pyramid thing. Um, I think that doesn't exist. We are, I'm more with um, uh, Otto Neurath on this. I don't know if you're aware, this like in the um, uh, Vienna Circle, there was this, the, the, this debate between Moritz Schlick and Otto Neurath about uh, what is the foundation of human knowledge? And uh, Schlick was saying that, well, uh, we need to find the bedrock of something that doesn't change, and obviously that's logic and mathematics, because in all possible world we have logic and mathematics, and Otto Neura disagreed. He said, well, actually, we can't really find that because our situation, epistemic situation in the world, is not that of being in a bedrock. <laughs> We're kind of like thrown in a world, like he has this beautiful metaphor, like a sailor on an open sea, trying to figure out how your vessel works while you face like the storms and you can't really park like a car trying to figure out how your car works because it's like, it's, it's ongoing, right? The only time to actually really park aside is when you're dead. Yeah. So it's like, you don't want to park. You need to keep going and figure out how exactly you function while uh, you function, right? Um, and I also want to push against this idea that actually we replace, I think we replace the mind-body dualism um, with the brain-body dualism. We have somehow this idea that the brain is somehow different from the body, but there is no principle. I mean, you need to give me an argument 
where exactly the brain ends, where exactly the body begins, yeah? It's like if you zoom in, it's like they're both kind of like the same system and then you have different, I mean, I, I pushed back against one of the reviewers because he was like, well, I said, well, nobody will fund a, an institute for the stomach and the body because people will be like, well, stomach is the body, right? So why do you have so many institutes of the brain and body? <laughs> it's like, you need to give me an ontological argument viable. Why do you consider that actually the brain is not the body, some sort of like different uh, entity? Anyway, so as I said, it's like, we really want to look at this, how the system work in tandem, but that doesn't mean that we need just those two systems, yeah? And as I said, it's like, I'm not, doing this on out of the blue, so I'm not inventing this, this is something that already exists, and actually proponents of the embodied cognition uh, paradigm, like uh, Varela and Maturana, they already worked on this, but somehow got kind of like uh, forgot. Uh, Varela was actually a, a biologist before he published like, um, you know, um, his famous book on uh, the embodied mind. Uh, he was very much actually into immune system and he even coined the term immunology <laughs> and how the cells basically uh, work together. And um, this is something related with um, uh, the self and has been um, uh, taken over by some of the, um, his disciples. And as I said, this, I think this has been somehow sidelined, but I think we need to bring it back into the, into the focus. Um, so that's just the first step that we are doing. The second step is to take this idea that, well, I present it like the, the brain is not mental paper, it's just about the single organism, the single body. But in the next steps, we're looking at how exactly that body develops within another body. So how exactly a immune system develops in relation to another immune system to say, because in pregnancy it's mind blowing what is going on, right? So it's like in pregnancy you have two immune systems that need to negotiate <laughs> for sharing the resources and well, you're not me, but still me, but you know, it's like, you're okay. Uh, so, and, and again, I want to stress this, this is universal. Yeah, so it's not concerning some category of people. <laughs> All human organism, up to now at least, it kind of like been through this like um, negotiation. And we are all here, the success, I mean the results, successful result of the certain uh, negotiation between two biological uh, systems. Yeah, otherwise, we, yeah, uh, you have miscarriages and other things. It's kind of like a really, really delicate uh, negotiation. And um, I work with um, this uh, wonderful people and in the first step, I'm doing this because I'm an interdisciplinary researcher. So I'm, this is the theory, I'm a philosopher, but I plan to put this at test. <laughs> so we have computational models that are going to work with us. And also I'm planning to collect data, right? I'm planning to collect data from in pregnancy and um, we work with people in Tübingen, but also in uh, Zurich. So I want, to see, um, I want to gather like all the layers of like information that I need to actually make the, uh, the point I want to make, yeah? And I want to conclude towards the end, I think that's something that we should bear in mind going back to the philosophy. I'm, I mean, it was tough to have like, to be like a trained philosopher and then work with scientists at the beginning because they will look at you and say, mm, you don't know what the world really work is. And then I got it because I had to run experiments myself and I said, oh, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's like it's so much work, you know, more work than just like sit on a chair and think about uh, the immortality of the soul. But I also think that it's important that way around. I think it's important for the scientist to bear in mind some very simple philosophical principle. And um, one of those is, is like, this one by Locus, just like, we should never forget that actually we are the one investigating this, right? And getting out from the our investigation to the how the world works, <laughs> that's a massive step, yeah? It's like, we should bear in mind that that's actually, this is our take on whatever is there, right? It's not the reality or the truth. There's something, and, and actually kind of like different cultures, different uh, um, the times, they kind of like approach things very differently. So we're probably going to discover many, many things depending on the perspective that we are taking. Yeah. And as I said, I'm going to push, continue to push against this idea of like the brain body uh, dualism because I think that's um, uh, super important. And why is this super important? So for instance, like if you have a mental health problem, you go in a building, <laughs> you, 
if you have a liver problem, you have to go in a different building. So the mind-body kind of like distinction is so deeply rooted that we literally have different two different buildings and system to treat different states, right? Um, and also this is happening, what is happening right now with the, you know, um, the artificial um, agents kind of like digital areas, like we build artificial minds, which is happening in, in, in the brain, and we build artificial bodies and then we try to put them together, right? I think that's, that's also something that uh, we need to um, discuss. And um, one of the projects I'm running right now in my lab, we really look at this. So how the way we relate to ourselves and our body impacts the way we relate with others in other way around in um, humans and, um, and artificial agents. So this is my team. I'm going to hire a couple of people, more people to work with me on this. But um, the basic idea is that so most of the projects focus on how we attribute like human-like mental states to the artificial agent. I really don't care about that. I care actually the other way around. I care what does it does to us, to our human body, to interact with artificial agents versus artificial versus humans. And I'm going to run a like battery of experiments where I look basically at different type of artificial embodiments like in humanoid robots that is running right now as we speak, uh, virtual reality and chat books. I'm going to take a battery of measures what is happening in a human body during this type of interaction from psychophysiological, respiration, day skin, uh, skin conducts and heart rate variability. I'm, I'm taking neural measures, I'm taking phenomenological, I'm taking behavioral, I'm taking a bunch of measures. Um, and um, so that's the first step. And the second step, I'm doing this cross-culturally because I think this also is very important. It's like people react with, I mean, interact with artificial agents very differently in different uh, cultures. And um, I'm open to further collaboration. So if you are interested in, you know, um, collaborate with, um, with us on this, um, I'm very open. For now, I'm doing the experiments in uh, Portugal, UK, South Korea, and Japan. And um, as I said, it's like, I really hope that our meeting, this meeting here is just like the first of a string of meetings that we're going to have. I invite you to come and visit us in Lisbon. It's also a fantastic city. We have the wines, we have the sea, <laughs> and it's less expensive. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, yeah, you are uh, very welcome to uh, join us. Um, and also a bit of like uh, self-promotion. So I'm currently uh, writing a book. Um, and um, I'm playing a bit with the fact that being French, if you're not a knee to Rene, becomes the first um, female name, like Rene, right? And I, because I'm still obsessed with the mind-body problem, but I, I'm, as being a philosopher, I said, okay, so I imagine a world, this is a fiction book, in which I, actually women were allowed to go to university and were allowed to do philosophy from the very beginning, right? Not just like 50 years ago. Okay, so now imagine you have a female, French philosopher called René Descartes, who is pregnant, and she has this question, it's like mind-body problem. How, how does my mind relate to my body, and how many minds I have in here, how many bodies I... <clears throat> so I'm trying to revisit the classical philosophical problems, but through the perspective of different diverse type of like... <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> I stopped smoking and my lungs are unhappy. <laughs> so I need a cigarette. Um, so in a, kind of like in one year, I think it's going to be um, uh, finished, hopefully. But yeah, so I want, to, I want to show that basically the classical philosophical problems that we have right now basically might be just like side effects of a certain way of looking at things. And we are missing basically how half of the humanity, human uh, basic might have actually a take on uh, deep philosophical uh, problems, yeah. And I also invite you to collaborate with me because I'm, as, like, as I said, I'm a philosopher working with scientists, but also I, I also want to work with artists because it keeps me sane. <laughs> Just like put me in a perspective, artists, I love artists. Um, so we are having this network for embodied consciousness, technology and arts. We are running a lot of like um, experiments and collaboration installations. And uh, I started in London, now I'm doing it in Lisbon. We plan to do it in collaboration with Hong Kong as well. But as I said, it's like I'm still open to collaborate with people. So come and um, see me if you, um, you are interested in this. And with that, I would like to uh, thank my lab. I'm a new PI, I started last year, so it's like I'm moving fast. <laughs> um, but, um, and this is my collaboration, and I 
also would like to thank you for all the talks and all the discussion that we had so far because I learned a lot. And as I said, as I really hope this is just a starting point of something bigger. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I covered a lot of territory. Are there questions? Um, yeah, thank you. That was really interesting, and I look forward to the book. <laughs> um, I was just wondering what your views were on like Paul Bloom's account of um, dualism, that we're innate, intuitive dualists. Uh, so that kind of solves the problem of like, oh, we have dualist intuitions, but it has nothing to do really, well, it doesn't reflect like the, the world that reflects our psychology yeah, I, and how yeah, we I deal Yeah, I think that. I think that's cultural. I think that's cultural. I think that intuition comes from the Western cultures. But if you ask exactly the same question to different cultures, they will say no. It's like yeah. They have like animism, right? It's like a soul is everywhere. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for a delightful talk. Um, are, tell me why you're still wedded to the. Um, self-perception view of the immune system. I think that's part of it, but it certainly can't be all of it. Hmm. So I'm, so maybe self-perception is not correct, correct uh, word here, um, because perception already involves some sort of like, um, you know, individual perceiving, right? Like, um, but if you take something like very basic, like a self-organizing system, yeah. And then, and then you have, you need to have some way to keep in track of like this system rather than that system. So this means that, so I developed this in relation to um, experiences in general, but maybe I need, I need to develop this in relation like um, on a subpersonal level, which doesn't involve experience, but I have this idea that the, um, in, uh, the, the self in the middle is somehow like the still I in the moving cyclone, right? It's like it has to be there for the system to, well, persist, grow, and potentially reproduce. Even though, kind of like, um, sometimes it tends to get overlooked. And I think I, I'm, 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 I think that uh, the immune system is is a key role in that stability of, you know, it's like keep making sure that the the, the backbone is still somehow the center, the core is still there while moving, right? So. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is like, I really think that we don't have the concepts, we don't have the conceptual toolbox to understand this phenomena. And probably because we have inherited so many ways of like analyzing stuff that basically we, we, we lack the conceptual toolbox and yeah, we will need a lot of time to actually, uh, uh, you know, unfold this and um, create new concepts. Um, but, yeah, I, I think that's that's one of the idea. We really need to have something that keeps track of the self in relation to whatever is not the self. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll just throw out there. This is really fascinating. Um, Thank you. The adaptive immune system is actually much newer than neurons, right? Like the phyletic distribution of neurons is in many, many organisms that have no T cells or B cells. Mm. B cells and T cells and macrophages and all of those things are actually very vertebrate thingies. Mm. And actually, you know, Hydra has neurons, has no adaptive mm. immune system. So I'm just curious if you have thought at all about innate immunity of the kind of CRISPR-Cas9 or something like that, um, uh, uh, and the way that that spans across really all evolutionary scales, whereas mm. the adaptive immune system is really a vertebrate innovation. Yeah, so I, so I, I still need to think about it because for, for now I, I focus just on humans. And I think the next step would be, as you said, is like to look at, um, so the first step is uh, to look at how the immune system unfolds, right, in relation to the um, uh, mother human system. And um, basically, we are doing some work on uh, placenta. Uh, so we're taking this work, uh, this famous paper by Varela, it's just like not one, not two, right? It's like, uh, what is happening there? How many systems you have? Is it one, is it two? It's like, and there is a lot of like, and we want to say it's not, it's not one, it's not two, it's maybe three, and actually maybe even more, right? It's like, it's, 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 a, it's a cocktail of 
so many, uh, you know, uh, uh, systems, yeah, that they need to uh, coordinate and tandem to actually make it um, make it happen. And then the interesting question would be, as I said, it's like why some systems have it and some systems don't have it, and whether we can relate this with the famous that I'm obsessed with, the self awareness or self perception, right? Um, and and uh, and the relation to the other. So I don't know. Yeah. We have a little bit more time. Any other questions? I've been struck by how integrated the body is in all of its respects. The role of the nervous system in affecting the immune system and vice versa. Mm. And even plants have immune responses. So we have a long way to go to understand the basis of immunity in simple systems. Yeah, but I think we still have a long way to go because I just came from a conference on um, uh, conscious experiences in New York and so it, all it was about neural correlates in the brain. <laughs> I was like, oh, again, in my head I was like, this is boring. <laughs> you know, we, we need to go back to the body and the cells are way more interesting. Yeah, but uh, we have work to do. Thank you again. Very Thank much. you.